time, I'll, is this working? Okay, good. Uh, first, uh, let me tell you how proud I am that we have 18 United States Senators that are here at COP26. Now, I was at COP21, and I was very proud to lead a delegation of 10 United States Senators, including Senator Whitehouse, who's with us here. That was a great moment for America in leadership to develop a plan to help save our planet. 18 of us are here because we think it's equally important during COP26 for us to reaffirm and get on the trajectory to accomplish what we set out in COP21, the 1.5 percent goal. We need to accomplish that 1.5 degree goal. That has to be accomplished. And we can do that by reaffirming those commitments that will get us to that level and do it in a way that we have accountability and every nation in the world does its share and those that have the resources and the technology help those who need help. That's our goal. We had one session in which we were asked what did we like best about what's in the Build Back Better budget and the reconciliation and the infrastructure bill and that would take more time than we have here today. So during this question and answer format my colleagues will have an opportunity to talk about an issue that is of importance to them. I'm going to mention one issue before introducing our delegation that's with us here. And, and that is to talk about an issue that Congressman Hoyer, the majority leader of the House of Representatives, who was scheduled to be with us today, but could not because of the votes on the floor of the United States Congress, he would have made this presentation in regards to legislation that he's authored, Amazon 21, that would authorize $9 billion to the State Department Trust Fund to help developing nations protect and restore their forests and their national carbon sinks. We need to do our share in the United States, and the Build Back Better budget does that for our domestic deforestation, but we also need to get involved in the international community and do our fair share. So we are committed to doing what we need to in America. We're all extremely excited about the passage of the infrastructure bill that has incredibly important provisions, and Senator Carper just walked in on the Environment Public Works Committee, and you'll hear him on the second panel, but it has incredibly important provisions that deal with the climate agenda. But when we pass the Build Back Better budget, it will include even greater issues. I see Senator Ossoff is also with us, who's not on the podium here. There are two of our senators who have been part of our delegation and part of our extraordinary leadership on behalf of climate. You'll be hearing on this panel from Senator Bob Casey from the great state of Pennsylvania, Senator Dick Durbin, who is the Deputy Majority Leader of the United States Senate, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from the great state of Rhode Island, who's been one of our champions in regards to carbon issues and so many other issues, and Senator Martin Heinrich from New Mexico. We're going to use a question and answer format, and, and Verena is going to lead us in that effort, and let me turn it over to, to Verena. Thank you very much, Senator Cardin. I'm Verena Radulovich. I'm the Vice President for Business Engagement at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. We are a nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C., and today you're going to see me do a machinations between my mask and my headphones, so here we go. I'd like to ask the first question to Senator Durbin. Senator Durbin, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Deal, just passed yesterday and is intended to grow the economy, make us more competitive, create jobs, and make our economy more resilient and just. Generally, as Majority Whip in the Senate, can you tell us how addressing climate change serves as a catalyst for American job growth, economic development, and innovation? Here? Try to do it here? I am? Okay. Well, good. Thank you for that question. When we return to Washington in a week, we will start consideration of the reconciliation bill uh, to translate that into something you might understand. This is the Build Back Better bill. There are aspects of that which really focus on America, 
in American families and workers, as it should, our highest priority. But equally important is our commitment when it comes to the issue of climate change. There's a major investment, the biggest investment in our nation's history, in resilience and creating economic incentives and opportunities for investment in renewable and sustainable energy around our nation and in the world. We all understand what the president said when he said it was time to act here. This is, as John Paul Sartre might say, existential. It really gets down to the bottom line as to whether or not we are going to survive as a planet. Coming together here at COP26, just taking a walk through this business center and talking to so many people, you get a feeling of optimism and positive feeling about our future. It, it's absolutely essential at this moment that we do our job to reinforce that and that you do yours in your own way. Because around the world there is a skepticism and a cynicism about whether democratic governor, government or any government can function to solve the real problems of our time. This is a real problem. This investment is our highest priority. And this is an issue which many people in our nation will judge us by as they should. So thank you all for being here today and pushing forward with COP26. Thank you very much, Senator Durbin. I'd like to ask the next question to Senator Casey. Senator Casey, last month, the U.S. Agency for International Development announced an updated global food security strategy. The strategy includes an emphasis on tackling the immediate and long-term impacts of climate change in order to reduce global poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. Can you speak to the intersection of climate change and food security and the ways in which Congress is working to address this issue? Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to reiterate what Dick Durbin just outlined with regard to what's coming up. Uh, we're going to pass the second part of this. Having the, the infrastructure bill in place is absolutely critical. But the second thing that happened last night is they passed a rule. That's, a, that's the, the predicate or the, the prelude to getting the, the um, Build Back Better budget legislation passed. Why is that important? Because that bill will have in the neighborhood of $550 billion that's going to be focused on climate change. Uh, so, so consistent with everything that's been discussed here at COP26. Part of that effort, not just in the short run with regard to the bill, but the longer term, has to be a focus on food security. Uh, we know that that was a, a problem long before COVID-19, ever more so in the aftermath of COVID-19. So the number of uh, people in the world who are hungry today is much higher. Um, I'll, someone here might know the exact number, but it is not tens of millions. It's a lot more than that. The number of people who are suffering from extreme hunger or really in jeopardy of, of death from uh, not having enough to eat, that number is way up. So we have a moral obligation to those who are hungry in the world, regardless of what happened in COVID-19 and regardless of any discussion here, but ever more so in light of what climate change can, can mean for even greater, more horrific, if that's possible, and it is, unfortunately, more po poss the possibility that in the next couple of uh, decades, you would see even higher numbers of people that are living in extreme poverty. So we're going to continue to work to uh, improve upon and get additional funding for the Global Food Security Act. When I was um, the Democratic lead on that bill, I had three Republican partners. Dick Luger from Indiana worked with me on it. We didn't get it, we didn't get it authorized, but he started, he brought me into it, he started it. Then he left the Senate. He lost an election, which is a big loss for the whole Senate. Then I worked with Mike Johans from the state of Nebraska. Then he left the Senate. And then I worked with Johnny Isaacson. President Obama signed it in 2016. We have to make sure that that reauthorization between now and 2023 is accomplished. But as we meet our climate change goals, we have to make sure that we have an intensive focus uh, on food, on agriculture, and of course, food insecurity. We just had a panel discussion here uh, on the aim for climate, a new initiative uh, to focus on these issues that relate to farming 
and ultimately giving farmers the, the tools and the resources they need to be part of this solution. A lot of farmers in America are already working hard every day on climate change solutions. We've got to make sure that that's a worldwide effort. Thank you, Senator Casey. I'd like to turn the next question to Senator Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, fewer senators have shown more concern for the climate crisis and worked harder to propose more ideas on how the U.S. can take ambitious action on climate. Your carbon pricing bill includes a border adjustment mechanism, an idea that the European Union will now be implementing in conjunction with, with its cap and trade regime. If the United States Congress does not pass a border adjustable domestic carbon price, what will be your position if the EU and other jurisdictions with a carbon price, such as Canada, start imposing carbon levies on U.S. manufactured goods? Well, first of all, thank you, Verena, and thank you to C2ES. This is um, my fourth COP, and I have been a Senate delegation of one. So it's exciting to be part of a Senate delegation of 18 here, and I think it sends a really important signal. Um, let me tell you first where we are in the carbon price. Um, we are 49 out of 50 votes in the Senate to pass a price on carbon in this reconciliation bill in the next few weeks. If we do that, the House has assured us it will also pass it, and the White House has assured us that the President will sign it into law. So we are very close to actually getting a price on carbon. If we do, then the question of border adjustment becomes quite easy because you have a very good denominator to compare country to country. If we don't, it gets very complicated, and we're going to continue to work on that. For now, I think a lot of the work on border adjustment has been on hold while we sorted out whether or not we would land this carbon price, which we're so, so close to doing right now. Um, I very strongly believe that this is a global crisis we are in and that without a global price on carbon with enforcement through border adjustment, we're going to very likely fail at hitting the 1.5 degrees target. So if for some reason we're not ready to pass the carbon price and to implement the border adjustment that we should be implementing and the EU decides to go ahead with the CBAM, God bless you for doing that. If Canada sets up its price on carbon and decides it wants to protect its border with a tariff over that, God bless them for doing that. If Mexico or others want to do the same, that actually could be the thing that makes the difference in Congress to actually getting this done. What we've got to concern ourselves with is the end state. And the end state is a world in which it is no longer free to pollute the atmosphere and the oceans with carbon. And people who cheat on that face a consequence. That's our goal, and we're going to work very hard to get that done. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I'd like to turn now to Senator Heinrich. Senator, since your tenure in the Senate began, you have advocated for policies that would help develop clean energy technologies and the infrastructure and programs needed to advance them. Going back to the bipartisan infrastructure deal, we heard earlier that measures to reduce emissions from, well, sorry, we're, we're going to hear measure, measures about reducing emissions from transportation, but what I'd like to ask you is what are the policies that are most transformative specifically to the power sector, as the power sector is the second largest source of, of emissions in the United States? And also, how do these um, uh, initiatives on the power sector complement the Build Back Better package that is still pending? Thank you. Uh, I, so I started all of this back in the early 90s as an engineering student, and uh, we built a carbon fiber electric solar car that we raced from Dallas to Minneapolis in the United States. And I've been absolutely fascinated with the power sector ever since. Uh, one of the things that's in the uh, infrastructure bill that hasn't received a lot of attention but is an enormous enabler for the the clean generation that we've unlocked since 2009 when we passed the Recovery Act and first created tax incentives for, uh, for clean energy is a, a real focus on transmission. And investments in transmission, low income financing for trans, or low interest financing for transmission, and also a major change in policy. 
which is to say that if a, an individual state tries to stop the kind of interregional transmission that's necessary for us to build the grid of the future, that you can't just say no, that there is a path through what we call the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission to get that stuff built. And that is going to make an enormous difference in how quickly the grid of the future gets built uh, in coming years. You take all of that and you pair it up with the tax incentives that are in Build Back Better. Moving out the renewable energy, wind and solar incentives, making them refundable so they're no longer dependent on uh, you know, how much tax equity is available uh, from the banks, but really widening the aperture of what's possible. And then for the first time, creating tax incentives to do the same thing with storage that we saw with solar create a pathway to lower and lower costs. We're going to need that storage to clean up the, the, the part of our grid that is hardest to clean up, the last 20 percent, when we've really built a lot of renewable uh, generation. Tax credits for transmission as well. We really tried to look the, at the entire power sector and try to plot the, the, the quickest path forward to rapidly decarbonizing the power sector. Thank you, Senator. And I'd like to turn to Senator Cardin, um, since we have some time. Senator Cardin, climate finance is critical to ensuring that developing countries can transition to clean energy effectively and deploy climate adaptation approaches. The discourse around responsibility, what is owed, and fairness can get quite contentious. But underlying this debate is the need for understanding how these investments serve the interests of investors in terms of opening up new markets, ensuring global stability, and security and creating new economic partnerships. How do you sell such U.S. investments, be it through bilateral assistance, contributions to the Green Climate Fund, or development finance corporation loans, as serving America's interests? Every one of those sources are important in making capital available, so we, we have to work on all those areas. I, I just left a, a program with some of my colleagues on Power Africa in which the Rockefeller Foundation in conjunction with USAID is making uh, financing available for power in Africa. Uh, one of the problems for investors are the costs associated with investing. When you have international partners such as the United States, the cost comes down pretty dramatically. So you need to have a source of funding. We do that in uh, some, uh, you'll find sources for that in our normal appropriations, You'll find that President Biden has taken certain steps that he can do administratively. You'll find it in the bipartisan infrastructure package, and you'll find it in the Build Back Better budget. We provide a green fund uh, that uh, several of our colleagues, including Senator Markey, who's with us but not personally present on the stage, help develop funds so that we can establish and leverage funding financings available to help the developing world. So that's additional resources that can be made available. You'll find that we have resources available in other programs. Uh, what we did in the, in the bipartisan package, we have grants to, uh, to uh, sectors that are going to help us deal with some of the financing issues. So there are different areas available where we can partner. How do you make it attractive? Do what Senator Whitehouse said. Put a price on carbon. That unleashes the private sector and allows us to have a fair return on investment. Let's get fair pricing here. So there's a lot of things that we can do to make it more attractive. Uh, but the bottom line is this. Every nation in the world, every single one needs to carry out what they are able to do, what they need to do in order for us to reach the 1.5 degree goal. Every nation. And those that have the resources or have the technology need to help in that regard. And that means making private sector investment more attractive in the developing world. We can do that. We can do it through our agencies and we can do it through our appropriations. And we plan to do exactly that. We've also been joined by Senator Brian Schatz of the great state of Hawaii, who is coming in here in a very conspicuous way. <laughs> Thank you.
which is actually the perfect segue because we're going to thank this panel. Please give our senators a, a big round of applause. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to invite up the second panel of our, of our distinguished guests. President Biden has been crystal clear that the climate crisis is one of the greatest threats that we face and must face together. And the time is now to act and act big. We've committed to reducing emissions by 50 to 52 percent by 2030. We're working to make every sector in our economy low carbon so that we can reach net zero by 2050. All across our country, leaders from every sector are working arm in arm to reduce pollution, increase climate resilience, protect public health, and deliver environmental justice. When we didn't have a leader on the national level, states stepped up. We launched the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. It's a plan that moves all sectors of our economy to carbon neutrality by 2050. For a long time, there's been a misconception that preparing for the future comes at the expense of economic growth and good paying jobs, but it's really not a binary choice. It's a both and. We created 11,000 auto jobs working to diversify the economy and the future of mobility. The big three automakers, they've shown real leadership moving us toward a clean energy future. Each has set targets to shift to full EV manufacturing, and we have rolled out initiatives to facilitate that transition and make it easier for Michiganders to hit the road and continue to create jobs in the Motor City and across the state. There is a very strong willingness on the part of steelworker members really across the country to do something about climate change. For us, one of the biggest ways that we can ensure that domestic industry is here for the long term is by advancing policies that will help them to be more efficient and decarbonize so that they can actually exist 30, 40, 50 years from now. We're committed to being on the right side of history and we're committed to creating a path forward for our membership across all sectors. What I see across many businesses is that there's investment against this challenge. And there's excitement to invest against this challenge. I'm a big believer in public-private partnerships where we're working with other companies with expertise and then with government policy to make change or to drive improvement of business, in our instance, agriculture. Agriculture is part of the solution, and we can make that happen with speed. We can be a carbon sink, and if you get sequestration of a third to half a ton an acre, you can see what the opportunity is over time. We have to feed a growing world population, and we have to do it in a more sustainable way. And I see farmers investing to do that, and that's exciting. That says we're focused, and we're going to try to move as quickly as possible. This is happening right now. We are in the midst of a global crisis, and it makes sense to think globally, but we need to act locally. And so we as cities have an obligation to step up where uh, global governments have stepped back. We've set goals of reaching 100% clean and renewable electricity by 2023 in our city enterprise, and by 2030 in the city at large. We're no longer at the point when doing something that is environmentally sustainable is cost prohibitive. It's actually the right financial decision. Now we also need to make sure that we're having key investments in communities that have traditionally been left out so that in time, we don't see the environmental injustices that we do today. Across the country, every community has so much at stake and so much they can contribute. We are united in this effort to address the climate crisis and together with courage and creativity, we can build a brighter future and save this planet, a future that we are proud to hand to our children.
initiatives that are important to fulfilling U.S. climate commitments. And with that, I would like to begin with Senator Carper. Se <laughs> Chairman Carper, much of the focus today is on the Build Back Better Act for meeting the U.S. climate commitments, but the bipartisan infrastructure framework that just passed last night takes important steps to reducing transportation sector emissions, <laughs> which represent the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Could you please talk about the Environment and Public Works Committee's important bipartisan work to curb transport emissions specifically? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Uh, early this year, uh, Joe Biden was sworn in uh, on January 20th. About a week later, he called me and he said, uh, we, uh, I want you to put together a small group Senators have come over to meet with me in the, uh, the Oval Office. Let's talk about uh, car, uh, climate change. Let's talk with a special focus on, on transportation. And uh, Ben Cardin and I and a couple of other colleagues uh, two weeks later showed up in the, the Oval Office to talk about how we reduce uh, emissions from, uh, from cars, trucks, and vans. There used to be a, a, a bank robber back in the Great Depression, a guy named Willie Sutton. And he uh, would rob bank after bank after bank and finally got caught. And they took it before the judge, and they, uh, they asked him at his trial, they said, Mr. Sutton, why do, you, uh, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. That's where the money is. And, and the reason why Joe Biden wanted uh, our con congressional delegation, our senators, to focus on reducing carbon emissions from transportation is because it's not where the money is, but that's where a lot of the, uh, it's the greatest source of carbon emissions. Tr cars, trucks, and vans are out 30% of our uh, carbon emissions in this country. Uh, uh, Electric power plants, about 25%. The, uh, the last uh, maybe 20% comes uh, from, uh, from uh, other, other sources. We went to work. Joe Biden said, Get, I want you to report out a service transportation bill by uh, before Memorial Day, before Memorial Day. Within three months, we had passed out unanimously from our committee water, drinking water legislation, wastewater legislation, unanimously. We passed it on the full Senate floor, 89 to 2. Within uh, literally three months of our conversation with the president that day, we had reported out unanimously service transportation legislation. 35% increase in the authorization for uh, roads, highways, bridges in this country compared to the last five years. And for the first time ever, a, a, a climate title. We never had a climate title in a transportation bill before. So we had a climate title in there that provided uh, tens of billions of dollars to uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions from our transportation. I'll just give you a couple of uh, examples. You ever get behind a uh, bus, maybe a school bus? Say, boy, that, uh, that's, uh, that bus put out a lot of stuff. Major source. We put, I think, $5 billion just for uh, school buses uh, alone. We put, uh, I've never been to a port before. Got all those ships in there and the, uh, the equipment moving uh, the cargo. It's a huge source of carbon emissions, but about another $5 billion there. Put a lot of money toward, uh, climb, toward the charging stations, fueling stations. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, people starting to buy. Anybody here have an electric car? Anybody here? Uh, yeah, we need a place to charge them. We need a place to charge them. And, and uh, a lot of money in our uh, service transportation legislation toward charging. The last thing I would say is this. Uh, as, as happy as I am, to see the service, uh, the uh, infrastructure bill, which my committee, our committee, Environment and Public Works Committee, wrote a large, a large part of it. As happy as I am to see that, it's, this is not the only uh, game in town. We need the, uh, the Build Back Better reconciliation uh, package. It has, among other things, uh, just huge monies for climate, huge monies for climate. We need that. The other thing we need is, is tax, uh, tax policy. A lot of tax policies, one example. Large trucks and vans uh, in the future, in order to get their reductions down or carbon emissions down, we're going to need hydrogen. We're going to need clean hydrogen, green hydrogen. And uh, there is a lot of good provisions in Build Back Better to provide through tax policy production tax credit for green hydrogen and, and, and investment tax credit for clean hydrogen. So that's uh, it's not, it's more than just uh, an infrastructure bill. Thrill we have an infrastructure bill. We need the, uh, the Build Back Better, the reconciliation bill. And then we need the tax policy that's in, that's in uh, part of that. And when we get that, uh, we'll call Willie Sutton in to be our witness. And uh, I think he would be proud of us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to turn. Yeah. I'd like to turn the next question to Senator Markey. Senator Markey, there is a growing body of evidence of climate change's impact on forced migration. 
The NSC recently released a report on the impact of climate change on migration, which comports with the warnings you've been espousing for some time. How would your bill to protect people displaced by climate change realize the recommendations of this report and provide greater protections for those most vulnerable to climate change? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. When, when, uh, when I took over as chairman of the Climate Committee in the House in 2007, my first witness, yes, I had the head of the Sierra Club, yes, I had the head of the CIA, yes, I had um, uh, other leaders, but my first witness, General Gordon Sullivan, former chief of the uh, Army, uh, chief of staff, uh, who, was, who was the one who sent in uh, our troops uh, into Somalia. You saw the movie Black Hawk Down. As he reflected upon what he did at that time, he now realizes that it was a drought that had led to a famine, that had led to peoples who had never been in proximate uh, 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 closeness together, who now were fighting over limited resources. It was a climate refugee situation that was leading to instability. That was 13 years ago. Today, the United States just has to be honest. 40% of all of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere, historically, is red, white, and blue. This is a national security issue for us, but it is a moral issue for us. It's why I'm proud that President Biden is putting in $11.4 billion a year uh, into the global fund to be able to deal with these issues, especially those uh, in the poorest parts of the world. But we have to do more. We have to do a lot more. People are dying. Babies are dying all over the world because of climate-related illnesses. We have a report which is absolutely conclusive that by the year 2070, if we continue business as usual, one-third of the people on the planet will live in areas where the heat is so intense, it will be uninhabitable. It's going to lead to massive climate refugee migrations across our planet. We have to do something about it. One of the things we have to do is just change the definition of who is a refugee. Right now, none of those people would qualify because our definition just deals with persecution. Well, there's something that's coming that's going to absolutely have a profoundly negative impact on at least one-third of the planet in the United States and the Europeans and increasingly the Chinese are responsible for that. And so this is a moral clarion call that we must stop any further international financing of fossil fuels. We just have to shut it down. We're not going to allow it to happen anymore because we know who is going to pay the price. It will not be the wealthiest, it'll be the poorest. It won't be the white population, it'll be black and brown and poor and islanders all across this planet. So the United States, we must change. We have to change our definition of who is a refugee. We have to just start accepting the fact that we're going to have to let them in because we did it to them. And we have to put the funding in place so that we can take care of those people across the planet. This is the moral issue. Yes, climate change is the environmental, the national security, the economic and environmental issue of our, of our time. But at its core, it's the moral issue of our time. And we have a moral responsibility in an interconnected world to make sure that we no longer finance in any way or tolerate any international financing of fossil fuel projects and that we begin to create the policies that open the door to those who are inevitably, inexorably going to be impacted by the already too dangerous greenhouse gases that are up in the atmosphere. That is what I believe this conference should be all about. That is what young people are protesting outside. It's the harm that's being done to those who have done no harm. It's to those who are most vulnerable, and they want this conference to respond. It's a good thing somebody's protesting outside because we need to hear young people's voices because they are leading us towards a better 
more moral world, and the United States has to be a big part of that leadership. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Markey. I'd like to turn out to Senator Schatz. Senator Schatz, today is Nature Day at the COP, and I wanted to ask you, <laughs> the COP, and I wanted to ask you about your recently introduced Forest Act. The bill aims to tackle global deforestation that is driven by the production and trade of commodities. Why is legislation like this so essential? Thank you for the question, um, and thanks to my three great colleagues, um, and thanks to all of you. Uh, the Forest Act uh, is based on a, a very simple premise, and that is that illegal deforestation is being driven by commodities that are purchased in the United States, in the EU, and in China. And we introduced legislation, which is sort of the first cousin of what is about to be enacted uh, in the UK. Um, and something is also being considered in China, which basically says we will no longer import commodities that are derived from illegal deforestation. Now, many of you may be familiar with the federal law called the Lacey Act, which prohibits the importation of forest products from illegal deforestation. That is only part of the problem. As you know, a lot of the uh, slashing and burning um, is for the purpose of generating soy or uh, cattle. And we in the United States are the largest market for that. And for the first time, you have a number of countries working um, not quite together yet, but simultaneously on this problem. Uh, the business community is stepping up and we're all pleased to hear these incredible pledges to cut deforestation in half. But frankly, uh, there are not enough good uh, uh, people in the world and companies of goodwill in the world to accomplish this under a voluntary regime. This has to be uh, executed through supply chain transparency, through transparency for consumers, because there are tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who would stop purchasing products if they knew that they were derived from ruining someone's homeland, from lighting a rainforest on fire. They just don't know because they can't know. And our federal law seeks to change that. It also seeks to specifically prohibit the importation of these products that are, um, that are the result of illegal deforestation. And finally, to the point that um, Senator Markey has made about the obligations of wealthier countries, I think this is very key here. Um, it might even be morally satisfying, and there might even be a lot of nonprofits out there that would be satisfied if all we did was prohibit the importation of these products. But there are people who put food on the table for their own families doing this kind of slash and burn agriculture. And so it is not enough to just prohibit it. We have to provide them a pathway through technical assistance, through partnerships with business, uh, and through direct aid to give them something else to do to feed their families. That is our moral obligation. And as I've been to uh, several of these COPs, I have seen the young people rise up all across the planet and understanding that climate is a justice issue too, and it has to be grounded in the needs of people. And so as we try to hit our percentage targets, whether it's 1.5 or 2 or whatever, this has to be good for people. And that's one of the focuses of the Forest Act is to make sure that we do establish this regime. But it's not just the stick, it's also the carrot. We prohibit the importation of these products, but we also give people a pathway to prosperity because if these are the lungs of the earth, then we all got to pay for the lungs of the earth and not just force it on the global south. Thank you very much, Senator Schatz. Um, and last but certainly not least, Senator Ossoff from Georgia. In your first 10 months in the U.S. Senate, you've already worked hard to advance the country's clean energy efforts. Your Solar Energy Manufacturing for America Act and solar rooftop installation bills are moving forward. How will these pieces of legislation change the nation's approach to clean energy? Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. And I think we should thank our hosts and recognize our hosts. Uh, I want to commend the team at the UN and COP26. At this moment in our history, perhaps more than ever, we need international cooperation toward a freer and more sustainable and healthier and more prosperous world. 
Um, and there is a, a, a lot of folks who have set the stage to bring us all together securely to work together toward progress. So can we just take a moment and recognize everyone who's made this possible? And, and to your question, I think, look, it, it starts with the first principle that I think brings us all together and that motivates our shared legislative effort and my legislative efforts, which is that human flourishing requires a healthy habitat. And um, all of the interrelated environmental threats uh, which compound one another, climate change, the destruction of our forests, the acidification of our oceans, um, the collapse of our coral reefs, all of the, the devastating human consequences that flow from these require urgency. And so my legislative initiatives are focused on speed. Uh, Senator Markey is leading on wind, I'm leading on solar to supercharge the production and innovation of solar products um, to make them affordable for all by dr continuing to drive down the price of manufacturing, uh, to advance their efficiency and their capacity, and also to invest in making the deployment and installation of this technology by households and businesses affordable for all. So I've introduced the solar manufacturing bill, and I've also introduced legislation which is included in this budget so that uh, low and middle income households in the United States can afford the installation of solar technology. This can't be a luxury good. If we're going to uh, surge deployment of solar technology across our country, it can't be something that only the wealthy can afford to invest in. So by rapidly scaling manufacturing, driving down costs, accelerating innovation, and making the, the public investments to make its installation affordable for all, we can surge the deployment of this technology and meet the ambitious goal that President Biden has set, which is for 40% of U.S. energy production to be solar by 2035. Thank you very much to our four senators that have joined us for our second panel. That concludes the second panel. Um, if I can please be joined by everyone to give these gentlemen a round of applause. And with that, this concludes the event.